So one thing we read in the Tory Honors Institute is Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen from the 16th century. Melissa, help me out with, with The Fairy Queen. I mean, this is a 500-year-ish less old poem. Yeah. Um, it's tough sledding. Um, commend it to me. Tell me, uh, wh what's this book about? Why should I even read it? It's, it's, it's too old. <laughs> Uh, Spencer's trying in this poem to make sure that a bunch of medieval and earlier stories don't get lost for the English. So the first book of the long poem is about... How, how long are we talking? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's a six book epic poem, so 300 pages. So it's planned pages. to be like 24 books. Right. You can measure it in inches of width, something like four inches or something. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. uh, definitely, you'll definitely break the back of any paperback if you read it. Uh, it's, that, it's that big. Um, the first whole book tells the story of St. George uh, against the dragon. And so um, it's an adventure story about a knight who has to slay a dragon for a lady and he runs into all sorts of obstacles on the way. He's called the Knight of Holiness. And in each book of the poem, Spencer picks uh, a knight uh, to be a patron of a particular virtue. So in, in The Fairy Queen that exists, we get an account of holiness, of temperance, of chastity, uh, which actually has a female knight, that's the exception, uh, of friendship, courtesy, and justice. Um, so. The, yeah. Though he represents holiness, sometimes he just represents a person on the way to holiness. So he could just be any Christian on the way to holiness. And though also because he's St. George, who's the patron saint of England, at times he, he, he takes on the resonance of this is England, uh, who is, uh, who's Protestant England, who's, uh, who's fighting against the evils in the world of, of their day. Yeah, I mean, so, so late 1500s, I, I wouldn't think of England as the holiest of places. I mean, it can't even decide which religion it wants, whether it wants to be Protestant or Catholic. It's sort of a mess in all sorts of ways. Why, uh, why do that? I mean, is this uh, self-promotion? Is there something else going on here? Well, I mean, there's a very strong sense of English national pride. You think mm -hmm. of the uh, defeat of the Spanish Armada and how that uh, that wasn't just England, that was Protestantism uh, triumphant and maybe going to uh, spread its influence ar ar around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a funny mix of Protestant and uh, uh, what we, th it, as we approach it, we find it on the one hand, uh, there's some, there. He'll actually take some digs at Catholic, uh, uh, at Catholic monarchs or Catholic practice, but at the same time, if, if you're familiar with any medieval uh, literature, we go right back through the seven deadly sins and uh, penance and so much that is part of an older uh, uh, Christian tradition. Uh, in line with that, one of my favorite one of my favorite parts about the story of holiness um, is the way that I think. Spencer really does capitalize on some of the best of Reformation theology mm -hmm. um, in his picture of the accomplishments of the holy knight when he slays the dragon. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, in any hagiographic tradition, of course, the saint will be living out the life of Christ in their, in their victories. But in Spencer's Knight of Holiness, the poor, the poor man has to fail uh, and nearly die mm -hmm. This is after many failures, and this is his moment of triumph. And even in his moment of triumph, he fails twice, so that for two nights, uh, he lays in wait of revival uh, from the tree of life and the water of life. And then on the third day, which is always Christ's, uh, he is able to slay the dragon. So it's a more uh, explicit, I think, reference to the ways that the works of holiness are never even ours in any proper sense. And, and when we are able to have defeat, um, it is always Christ's. Why, why clothe this in a story? I mean, it, as you're telling that to me, I, I'm finding it compelling. I am hearing it even differently, mm. I think, than I would if someone were to just present the doctrine to me. But can you tell me a little bit more about why, why clothing it with a story? I, I think that Spencer's trying to instruct and delight uh, and, and to make sure that the instruction comes by way of delight. I, I, love, um, I love about Spencer that we get these, these verbal, I wanted to say pictures. It is, it is, a, it is a strangely um, hmm, 
pictorial. Uh, so you have a sense of this is verbal tapestry um, more than it is uh, m more than something like a dramatic uh, story with lots of character in inner life. Um, main answer to your question is. Uh, I, I think it's so that we will love what's lovely mm -hmm. and hate oh, what's loathsome. It's yeah. interesting because when you first said instruct and delight, it, to me what it sounded like was he's going to give you doctrine and he's going to let you have a good time in the midst of it. But I'm mm -hmm. hearing something further when you say love what's lovely. Right. I think that I think that he's uh, telling a story so that without noticing it, mm -hmm. we will start to incline towards uh, good-heartedness, our affections will be trained without us even noticing, because you want the knight to win. Uh, yeah. That idea of training the affections is one that uh, C.S. Lewis really picks up, and he's one of the great modern defenders of Spencer mm -hmm. and helps us mm -hmm. to read it well. And in his day, people were saying, you know, poetry needs to give us novel experiences and explore you know, strange and uh, dark places that we've never uh, explored before. And he said, actually, one of the uh, the great benefits of poetry is that it helps us to love what's lovely. It helps us to have the right responses. The, the, the critics said, well, these stock responses, you know, everybody knows a sunset's beautiful or that, um, or that you know, good is lovely or children. He said, and C.S. Lewis says, no, we need to be reminded. And this book uh, helps to remind us, not just remind us, but it, uh, it, 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 give, it embodies the virtues and the vices in such a way that we have a uh, even visceral response to them. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when sin is exposed as it is in, uh, in the fairy queen, it's disgusting. And, uh, and, uh, and, when, and when beauty is unveiled, it's lovely. Yeah. Right. Joe, and I think, uh, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say, I think it's, it's actually hard to train our hearts, our sentiments, explicitly. None of us mm. can mm. can can necessarily submit to a don't feel that, Love feel this. this. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So 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 to be able to do that um, by unveiling and unmasking mm -hmm. seems to be really rich. I love how I love how Spencer so I, I think that my experience is we live in an age with a lot of if it's if we're gonna account for chastity for instance, mm -hmm. chastity is only explained by, here are all of the no's. Uh, don't, don't do this, don't love this, don't turn in this direction. Uh, in Spencer's book on chastity, he shows the fullness of married love and the fullness of a chaste virginity in, in both. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Let me ask one more question of you, Joe, for, I'm thinking of, you know, the high schooler who is gonna get three lines into this thing and think this is the most boring fair I've ever read. So if, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about the way that um, this compelling portrait of good and uh, ugliness sort of moves us, but if I can't get three, past three lines because the only way I'm moved is to sleep, I, you know, I found this soporific uh, rather than sanctifying. I mean, how do we kind of get over that hurdle? Well, let me back up and say one other hurdle, which is the the language of it is is difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you're a high school student, uh, it's, it wouldn't hurt you to find a modernized spelling and one that has glosses, that is, uh, each word's defined right out in the margin on the page that you're reading, and that can help you over an initial hurdle. Okay. But, uh, but, but in terms of the story, uh, the, uh, how, to, how to enjoy it, it's great, and C.S. Lewis is so much for this. He says, just enjoy it as a story about knights and ladies and dragons and monsters and fights, and and the uh, all of these wonderful training and virtue things will happen uh, unaware as you're enjoying the story. The Tory Honors Institute at Biola University. Biblically centered, great books, liberal education. More at biola.edu slash Tory.